A, B, C. Always B. Casting. A mantra you may have heard many a player repeat over your time in the game. Whether or not you realized it, this is one of the most important pieces of information you could ever be given. And so we come to this guide. Welcome to ABC, A Beginner's Guide to DPS. Don't let that length scare you. If you've seen any of my other content, you know I take a thorough approach, attempting to explain in ways a newbie will understand. So I will be covering a wide array of topics that will get you into the DPS role and performing better than you ever thought possible for yourself. I'll be covering topics a beginner should deal with while also going in-depth later into more intermediate and advanced topics that you would benefit from thinking ahead about. Just because you are a beginner doesn't mean you can't make use of these topics either. And if you want to learn beyond just a surface level, the more information you would benefit from. Take learning slow. Learn a concept at a time instead of all at once. It might all be info you want to know by the time you hit level cap, but you don't need to learn it all right now, immediately, level one. You are a pro and you must be. Everyone starts somewhere. You may know some info already due to osmosis, or you may have none. But you should take time to practice everything a little at a time. There's a lot you can do better and learn as you progress. There's a lot of levels before level cap and tons of DPS jobs you can take through the learning process. Practice first. And when you queue for dungeons as a newbie, nobody knows your experience level. If you're not confident in yourself, tell your group, hey, I am a newbie. Advice is appreciated. There's an unfortunate fear in people that causes them to typically not give advice at all unless asked for it first. So I recommend asking for advice outright, even if you think you're doing well. You never know what things you could be doing better. Make heavy use of the chapter select for traversing through subtopics you already understand and such, but you never know if you might learn something new when you watch it. Let's get started on the wide world of DPS and all its many roles. Before we get into any specific topics, let's dispel a misconception. DPS do not have the least responsibility next to tanks and healers. They have different responsibilities and arguably are the most important responsibilities. The Trinity system is called as such not just because there are three roles, but because the three roles synergize with each other. All three roles have many shared responsibilities, such as learning boss patterns or dealing with mechanics. However, the role of DPS in all of these is greater than that of either healer or tank usually. The amount of damage you put out is higher than tanks and healers, often needing a tank and healer combined to account for one of you if you play your job right. And the amount of damage a party puts out has a direct influence on how much tanking and healing is required. When a tank fails a mechanic, they will usually end up surviving due to their much higher defenses alone. And if they die, someone else can take up the tank mantle for a while just fine. Even tank busters outside of higher end duties can be taken by a DPS safely on the average. Healers need to survive the failed mechanic, but they can just easily heal themselves up, no problem. If they do die, if you have some mage jobs at higher levels, they can just raise the healer. And in the harder content, there is two healers, meaning both would need to die to cause any real issues. DPS, meanwhile, do not have these capabilities. If you fail a mechanic and live, you need to wait for the healer to heal you. Your second wind or any of the other abilities aren't going to be enough alone. On top of failing a mechanic and taking a big hit, even if you live, you often end up with a debuff. You either get a vulnerability up, which makes you take more damage, a damage down, which makes you do less damage, or both. Vulnerability stacks can typically be easily healed through as long as you're not collecting them to have four or five. Damage downs don't mean too much to tanks and healers because their damage, while still important, is less important than the damage of a DPS. DPS, meanwhile, their role is literally called DPS, damage per second. 
that is your main extreme power, and damage downs make your main use much less effective. Side note, if you want a dictionary of terms to learn for the game, there's a card in the top right that has a video on it. Tanking and healing is about minimizing how much you have to do. You use cooldowns at very specific points to minimize how much you need. DPS, meanwhile, is about doing as much as you possibly can, because your main point is DPS. And if you die, there's a raising penalty. 25% less damage for about two minutes. That is a lot of damage. If you die a second time, you have 50% less damage for two minutes. And at that point, your damage is as low as a tank's or even lower to be a healer's DPS. This makes it harder to heal as a healer too, but your goal as a healer is to heal as little as possible. 50% less effective healing means you must do twice the healing, but if you only needed one heal, you only need two heals now. DPS losing 50% of their namesake is way worse. Meanwhile, your rotations are far more complex. A healer can basically mash their DPS buttons at random and put out enough damage for a healer. Tanks have to do a little more, but generally don't have insanely complex rotations. But they can get slightly complex. And DPS run the gambit from pretty simple to extremely complex rotations to put out good damage. Not even top 1% player damage, just generally good damage. There's a lot more rules in place for how you want to set things up or treat a DPS rotation. Almost all of your buttons are about DPSing, with a few others we'll talk about later. And each one plays very differently to the next one next to it. I'll never whine and say healers and tanks are super homogenized, because even when they were more unique, quote-unquote, they all still played relatively the same, at least when compared to how much DPS all differ between each other. Even within a sub-role, melee, ranged, and mage, the jobs play very differently. Dragoon is a slow job, while all the other melees bank on speed. But those three speed jobs get their speed in different ways, etc. I can go on and on. You ever see a tank solo a boss over 20 minutes? Which, don't do that by the way, please, if it's gonna take that long, don't bother soloing. Anyway, why does that same boss only take five minutes when you have living DPS? More complex, but still not high-end bosses? They won't do less mechanics just because your DPS are on the floor. They will do more mechanics. The same mechanics, but now you have to do it with less people, and good luck if it's some kind of hard-hitting stack marker. Plus, more mechanics because the fight takes longer. Big trash pulls tanks do are only reasonable in most dungeons due to the power the DPS have to make it a short fight. This also ignores DPS checks too. Most casual content has very easy DPS checks, if ever, but they are sometimes there. Then in harder and harder content, the DPS checks get tighter. DPS checks are a real thing that exists sometimes. It isn't just checks for healing and tanking. Bottom line, if you're of the idea that DPS are a dime a dozen, a shockingly common attitude I've seen over the years, you've not seen a good DPS. And that may even include your own DPS. And maybe it's time for some self-reflection. Just because there's no good in-game way to see who is doing good DPS, doesn't mean there isn't a difference. And on top of not being able to tell if a DPS is good or not, it's very easy to tell if a tank or healer is bad. That's why people think the role is so much harder, because it's much more obvious. Here's me tanking a boss without the tank. I even took the tank buster and lived. Here's me, a friend, and some random we picked up in Party Finder on Dancer doing the same dungeon without a healer entirely. If DPS is so replaceable in most content, well, you tanks and healers are just as replaceable. Because not only did we clear the dungeon without a healer, we did it faster than the run with a healer. 
Meanwhile, the Dragoon in that run kept insisting that it was impossible to do without a healer. A run can be completed without a tank. A run can be completed without a healer. And runs can be completed without DPS. And if you somehow manage to do it without DPS, the run will be two to four times longer than if you had DPS. Meanwhile, a run without a healer or a run without a tank doesn't see all that much difference compared to runs without DPS. That's the difference tank and healer elitists cannot see. They can't even see past their own giant ego to see they're just as replaceable as DPS. You're all equals, and it's about time everyone started acting that way. And if you're still going to claim healers are so important, then what is this? And why does the healer not need to heal you because you won't stop using it? This was maybe a bit much of a rant, but let's be real. DPS aren't unimportant plebs. Every role can play at different levels of contribution. Low DPS contribution often lowers the contribution of everyone else at the same time. And at the same time, don't let it go to your head. You might not be a worthless pleb, but you're not god of the group either. If the tank is learning and isn't comfortable with doing big pulls, you're a jerk for pulling for them, and I hope you end up in more day in jail. They may even be purposefully pulling less because the healer is new and don't want to push them. Maybe they queued together. If you want more mobs to fight, ask. Communication is a good thing, and you're all equals. On top of that, you don't decide pull size. And this time, I mean the reverse. You can ask the tank to pull more, but you have no reason to decide that they should pull less enemies. There is literally no reason for you to want less enemies. You do not benefit from less enemies. The people who say the tank needs to pull less as a DPS you have to be joking. That's the one place where you should not speak up. You politely ask for more, or you say nothing and do nothing and be a good DPS. And really, this is something that happens. <sighs> Deep breath. Ranting over. Let's get into some individual topics. The topics of this video are going to be even more interconnected than usual. And this seems like an extremely obvious topic to start with. You would think at least. But there's a lot of hiccups with understanding toolkits. It could be a job that starts at a higher level. It could be tooltips being difficult to parse. It could be tooltips outright lying, which sometimes includes a mission. Looking at you, Bard. I won't forget you, Bite Mastery. But my point is, DPS is the role where toolkits are most complex and most interconnected. Combos, proper rotation of abilities, etc. All roles do have some interconnectedness with their toolkits, but it's not nearly as tied together as DPS. This may be where you want a guide, be it mine or some other person's guides. And each job is very different in how they work, so you must learn different little things you have to deal with for every individual job, be it procs or other mechanics. The big thing that tends to be worrying is when someone asks, can I remove blank skill from my hotbar slash crossbar? The answer is almost always no. There are very, very, very few skills in the entire game that are not useful. Fluid Aura on White Mage, Undraw on Astrologen. Also, that's funny because both of those two are neither DPS. For DPS example, let's talk Physic for Summoner. Point is, if you can't make room for a skill on your hotbars, then you need to start experimenting with your settings, turn on or off hotbar cycling, add more hotbars, use the expanded crossbar for controller. You can't just toss away skills you don't like or something like that. That would be like taking away tank stance from your hotbars as a tank. The entire name is Tank Stance. It's kinda important. There are a lot of buttons in this game, nobody would deny that, but they all have their uses. 
They all are needed if you want to be performing as a good DPS. The exceptions are not common, and you are better off wasting the hotbar space than you getting rid of a skill that your job actually entirely is based on by accident and you just didn't realize it. Short section, but it's something I felt needed to be emphasized. It's a comment I got a lot since I started making my guides. And the answer is almost always on DPS job guides, so it needed to be said. Step 2 of DPS learning is using your toolkit. Your full toolkit. Not some buttons, all of them. Some buttons will obviously be less useful than others or more situational, but you will still want to be using them. There's still also proper timings for when you want to use your buttons. The most often incorrect time to be using your skills is before the fighting even begins. There are exceptions. Those are specific to individual jobs typically and are usually very specific off global cooldowns which if you didn't know what an off global cooldown is there's a dictionary of terms in the card in the top right again but it's one of those abilities with a very long cooldown let's take dragoon for the easiest example blood of the dragon is becoming passive with endwalker because of how it works right now you can turn it on basically at any point and be fine and never touch the button again mid-fighting. Before the fighting begins is the ideal time to actually use it. There's a time limit for how long we keep the buff up, but if you're playing the job right at higher levels, the timer is all but infinite. Bullshit. All the rest of our buffs, we do not want to be using before the fight begins. Lance Charge, Dragon Sight, and Battle Litany only get used once the fight begins as laid out in most openers. There is no way to extend the timer once they are up, so if you want to be making full use of the full buff timer, you have to use it after the fighting begins. This is imperative for a number of reasons. First off, the cooldowns are long, as I said. Several minutes to use them again. The amount of time you get to use them is limited. If you use them before the fight begins, the already limited timer is ticking down while you're not doing any damage. Secondly, the win is most important due to buffs being multiplicative. That is to say, the more buffs you use at the same time, the stronger they make each other. And the more time you're spending attacking while buffs are up, means you better make use of those multiplicative bonuses. And finally, there's the fact that your teammates are also putting up buffs. Some buffs are not even available to be used until a fight begins. So timing your buffs with those buffs further boosts everyone's damage if there's something that buffs everyone. Or, speaking as Dragoon, Disembowel doesn't get put up until at least the second attack of a fight. So... Timing things too early could lose you a bunch of damage. And so could timing things too late. If you try to use skills at the end of a fight, most of the time it will be wasted. If enemies are about to die, hold your big abilities with long cooldowns. Unless, of course, it's the end of the entire duty. If there's no more fights after this one, you may as well just dump it all. Ultimately, though, the worst thing you could do is just not use your abilities at all. Ignoring parts of your toolkit is entirely wasteful and it's something people do far too often in trash mobs. And I don't mean just your AoE skills. AoE skills are nice and good and you should use them, but I mean everything else as well. Your big buffs and such? Use them during trash. Trash mobs are far far more dangerous than boss fights when it comes to survival, especially if the tank is pulling a lot of enemies. The tank is in far more danger than the bosses will ever put them in. Don't bother holding all your abilities, use them to take down trash as quick as you can. It doesn't matter if the bosses die fast because you saved your big attacks, because the journey there was filled with very slow fights and potentially even party wipes. But also I mentioned AoE, Area of Effect Attacks. Use them please for the love of Railgear, use them please! I've gotten so many DPS players who just 
don't use their AoE abilities at all, that low potency on them, that's not the total potency of the ability. That's what damage every enemy gets hit by. 130 potency on 10 enemies is 1300 potency total across the entire attack. This is extremely important when the tank is pulling a lot of enemies. You might as well not even be there if you're using single target attacks. You'll be putting out so little damage compared to what you should be doing, but you don't even need this many enemies for your AoE to become effective. The barrier to entry for AoE to become stronger than single target attacks for most jobs is three enemies. Most pulls in the game will be at least three enemies. No matter what your tank does, even if they insist on single pulls because of bad gear or being new or any other reason, you can likely be using your AoE. Unless you're Black Mage, then HA! <laughs> Black Mage AoE. Point is, you can very easily be making use of AoE toolkits in party content. This isn't a piece you could just ignore. Well, unless you want to be a bad DPS, then ignore it away. Yes, I'm talking about you, Hall of the Novice guy who says not to use AoE. Openers are to say how you open a boss fight and are the best way to apply a toolkit to actual fighting. Trash mobs in AoE do not typically have openers made for them because of being much more of a freeform situation. Put up any buffs you have, spam your AoE skills that you have, weave in any other attacking skills. No, it's when you're up against bosses that you worry about openers. Openers are a concept born from the things I mentioned thus far. Buffs multiply together, allies are putting up their own buffs, and making sure you get your strongest skills as buffed as they possibly can be, making them way stronger. But things go deeper than that. I'm not going to get into it besides mentioning it, but openers can change based on what pacing each fight has, your skill or spell speed, and even party composition. That's mostly getting into min-max level of DPS, but I wanted to mention it as a show of just how important having a proper opener can be. You can just use a single general opener for all bosses and be plenty fine, but I would recommend having some kind of decent opener. I made a video in past about it, card in the top right, about why openers are useful to you. I recommend watching that, but I will also give a truncated version here. Buffing everyone together within the opener is a reason mentioned twice now, but it's not just the opener that this affects. If everyone is using their best stuff all at once, the moment it comes off cooldown, everyone's stuff will be coming off of cooldown. Chaos. You'll do what is called a re-opener, where everyone does their opener again, essentially. You can get several of these within a single fight for the longer ones. But consider how that affects you within a vacuum. Nobody else affecting you and you not affecting them. Doing the same opener over and over and over builds up muscle memory. You're practicing your job within the opening moments of a fight, repeatedly, every single time. Once muscle memory sets in, you stop looking at your hotbars as much and start paying more attention to the boss fight. But you won't entirely stop watching your hotbars, which is actually a good thing. Muscle memory can turn into mental memory. If you're at a specific spot in your rotation within a fight, you'll remember that after a dozen or so runs. I always use this ability right here, and then the boss uses this specific attack I need to avoid. You can connect your rotations to the boss's rotation. It's how I do a lot of my own gameplay in high-end fighting. I remember my position in the rotation at key parts of the fight. If I am behind, I know whether or not I should be trying this or that during the next mechanic. And ultimately, I feel like a job is best shown off when doing proper openers, at least once the opener is over. You're going to rotate through your skills a lot over the course of a duty, and when an opener is setting the pace for your rotation, you're going to lead right into a proper rotation of abilities. Being a greedy DPS can be a good thing. You're fighting as hard as you can, 
getting all the attacks in that you can, but there's a difference between greeting and getting yourself killed, which is something people who play conservatively seems to not realize. Some people really seem to believe that if you don't get out of an AoE immediately, you will die guaranteed. There's a gradient between playing way too safe and way too clumsily. Keeping uptime on the boss is a good thing, maximizing your uptime even better. Greed tends to be used when the player fails to get out of an attack, but there's a fine line between greeting an attack that kills you and being greedy with your play. To put it simply, don't get yourself killed. A dead DPS does zero damage. It's not worth it in the end if you die, but you don't need to panic the moment any part of the ground turns orange. Find the balance between running away instantly and learning when or where it is safe. Again, uptime is not greed. It needs to be emphasized. How much you can fit in also depends on what fight you are doing. Some fights you can afford to play greedier, while others you should play safer. It comes with practice and becoming more comfortable with your job. It becomes something you could just feel as you play and learn new fights. Play safe if you want to start, but you should learn how to not run away instantly. Now, avoiding damage is still all well and good, not dying, but not all damage needs to be extremely avoided at all costs. In a lot of fights, there will be mechanics that put AoE markers on players and follow them, but not all all players will get it. If you don't have an AoE marker, but the person standing next to you does, neither of you should move. AoE healing will go out regardless of if you take damage, because a bunch of other people did take damage. I outline a bunch of similar things like this in my Mechanics Beyond Memorization video. The boss doing something doesn't mean RUN AWAY RUN AWAY PANIC BUT NOT AT THE DISCO BECAUSE Eorzea DOESN'T HAVE THOSE! This especially applies to melee players. You don't need to book it away unless it is higher end content. And even then, you can just sp spread out. Look at all my footage. I'm holding my ground at all times unless I'm a ranged job. And even as those ranged jobs, I stay relatively close. AoEs can overlap just fine with few exceptions. It's all about not overlapping each other, the players inside the circles, and there's plenty of room around the boss to stay in range without running off. Don't be afraid of a little bit of damage from allied markers. If it's not an orange AoE, someone is getting hurt. And if RNG had dictated, you could have been the one getting the marker anyway. If only one marker, you can both get hit by it safely. If you do die though, don't panic then either. Wait to raise until any major boss mechanics finish, then get up as soon as possible. Most raid-wide damage outside of higher end content cannot hurt you while you are raising or immediately after. This is because you have 5 seconds after being raised of complete immunity. This buff here, Transcendence, let it do its work. You can move around, but don't use any actions until you get healed. You will likely just end up dead if you run right back into the fight without HP first. I know it's tempting. Your job is to be Steve Harvey and KILL! And it might not have been your fault you even died. But you need to wait for the heal. Or at least wait for the boss's raid-wide damage attack to go out before you start attacking. The buff is only 5 seconds long after all, so if the big attack is already over, the invincibility won't help you. The big issue is getting back into your rotation once you get back up. Depending on your job choice, some jobs have a HUGE penalty for death. Shadowbringer's Summoner is called a 2 minute rotation quote unquote, for better or for worse. And if you die at any point in that rotation, you have to start all over. Now obviously there is some hyperbole, but there's a grain of truth in there. Some jobs can pick up at any points as if they don't have a death. Others you'll need to salvage what you can, attempting to get back on track. This mostly ends up being a learn your job better kind of thing. 
Recovery from death is its own skill that's worth learning. Minimize your deaths where you can, and have patience when you do die. But also temper your expectations of what is lethal, and what you can do safely. Uptime and greed are different. Get as much uptime as you can, but live through it. But sometimes not every mistake is taking damage or not getting perfect uptime. Sometimes you just completely mess up on your rotation. This is okay. When you're learning, you're going to mess up your rotation even when no mechanics are happening or such. You'll just mess up. Again, that is fine. Don't panic. Don't treat it like the end of the world. Some jobs have it worse than others just like dying mid-rotation. But regardless of the job, recovering from a purely rotational mistake is much easier to do. Most jobs have what I call a pivot point, a place in your rotation where you can change what you are going to do as needed. For melee jobs, combo routes tend to be pivot points. Black Mage swapping elements is a pivot point. Once again, this comes down to learning a job well but these pivot points are often key for recovering from mistakes in your rotation. They're what you will want to do first to get back on track, even if you're now slightly behind where you intended to be. Messing up your rotation is fine, but you still need to learn from these mistakes. Is your keybind layout poor? Did you just fat finger the wrong skill? Did you do something else? These things are going to happen. Knowing what your contingency plan is, is good to figure out. The longer you spend flailing around trying to recover your rotation, the less damage you are dealing. Most importantly though, is figuring out how to minimize these issues entirely, and not getting extremely upset anytime they do. Practicing on striking dummies is extremely underrated. While you cannot practice doing your rotations under stress, and doing mechanics, you are building a solid foundation. What sounds easier to you? Practicing a brand new rotation in the middle of real combat? Or doing it on a dummy first that doesn't hit back? Practicing your rotation on a dummy gives you a chance to understand how it works before going into a real situation. It gives you a chance to see what issues you have before they end up costing you more than just the rotation itself in a vacuum. Practice makes perfect, but before that, it makes understanding. If you're constantly messing up at a specific point, you can try and see what issues you are having. Is it your fingers hitting the wrong buttons, etc.? Is the skill in the bad spot and you need to redo your hotbars? The second one is also a good time to go into dummy practice. If you decide to mess with your UI or hotbar layouts, taking a bit of time on a dummy gives you a light combat scenario to make sure you enjoy the changes that you made. Like, I feel like I'm over explaining this, but there's a weird amount of people I have met over the years who treat dummies like a waste of time. Applying a rotation to a real boss is all well and good, but most people can't just look at a rotation one time and know it perfectly by heart. A dummy lets you learn the basics. Applying the basics to a real fight gives you specifics. There's also the tunnel vision issue. When practicing your rotations initially, you probably stare at your hotbars, like, a lot. Perhaps even the entire time. This is something specific I have issues with myself when messing with my hotbar layouts or learning a new job. I tend to watch my hotbars even more than usual because I am unfamiliar with my layout. To reduce this, I will spend time on a striking dummy, at least for an hour if I'm going into high-end content with it. Being able to focus on a fight more is an objective good, and you'll be able to take rotation learning in two phases. The safe dummy learning to get your eyes off the hotbar the entire time, or at least most of the time. Then, some slight watching while you iron out the kinks mid-combat. And it's way better than trying to do something like Palace of the Dead to learn. Striking dummies live way longer than 10 seconds. Also, let me also mention Stone Sky Sea. It's not perfect, it's far from perfect. History has shown that 
numbers on Stone Sky Sea can be very incorrect, like Black Mage being the bottom half of DPS kind of issues, even though Black Mage puts out some of the highest damage in the game. Again, it's not perfect, but if you can't beat Stone Sky Sea dummies when using a rotation, you need to check your gear and maybe check if your rotation is even good. If you have the gear and you're still failing to beat a dummy, your rotation might be way worse than you think it is. Something you should also potentially try practicing is using defensive abilities while fighting a dummy. They won't have any effect, but you'll get used to using them mid-fight that way. And I don't just mean like third eye on samurai, I mean stuff like faint or addle or tactician slash troubadour slash shield zamba. There's a major, major lack of players using their defensive abilities in general. They're way more helpful than you might be giving them credit for, especially the non-faint abilities, but even faint has plenty of uses. A lot of dungeon tank busters are physical based. Every boss in the Katana Ravel has physical tank busters, for example. Plus, come Endwalker, faint will start reducing magical damage too, so big raid-wide damage will be able to be reduced by your faint usages as well. Addle from the mages will still be better for that goal, but every little bit of reduced damage can help the healer out, especially for the ones that hit very hard. Even in dungeons, the strongest raid wides can do around half the HP of a player. Even a little less damage there can make things safer. This is especially true for if you start taking avoidable damage. Avoidable damage is usually non-lethal by itself in lower end content but it still puts you in a much more dangerous situation and gives you vulnerability stacks, meaning you take more damage. Attacks doing 5 or 10% more damage to you is at least partially negated when you're reducing the damage by 5 or 10% in turn. Or when the tank is in that situation. Tank busters are already the sole scary thing for tanks to deal with in boss fights and do a lot of damage to them. If they stood in an AoE by accident, your enemy debuffs could make their survival just a little more assured. Obviously a tank and healer can easily handle it without your help in lower end content, but if you want to get into the harder content, every little bit of damage reduction helps, and even in that lower level content. Further, you don't need to make the healer do all the healing, and I don't mean Physic and Vakir. Stop it. Bad mages, go to your room and turn on the baby monitor. No, I mean Second Wind and Bloodbath. These are off globals you can weave into your rotation just fine. If you take avoidable damage, pop a Second Wind. If it was a lot of damage, pop Bloodbath as well. As the kind of player I am, I will often take some dungeon damage on purpose, because I can just heal myself back up with the skills. I would not recommend doing it yourself, but it goes to show how useful and how strong these skills are, and how you can break the rules with them a little bit if you're a good enough player. I want to backtrack to you ranged players though. You guys have no excuse to not be using your defensive utility. It affects both magic and physical damage. It affects the entire party within range. It lasts longer than either faint or addle. And it's not useful for just boss fights. It's actually more useful in trash packs in dungeons. I already told you how about trash is more dangerous than bosses. Addle and faint only apply to a single enemy unless Endwalker suddenly makes them AoE abilities. The ranged defensive buffs all affect everyone nearby, which should be the whole party. But in this case, the important part is affecting the tank which means all enemies will do less damage. It's technically not an enemy debuff, but when thinking of it this way, it's an AoE enemy debuff. And if you're an experienced tank, this improves how useful it is even more. If you watch what your tank is doing, you can see what defensive buffs they use. If they pull a ton of enemies or run out of strong defensives, you can further reduce the damage they take with your buff. 
So now, not only does how much DPS you put out affect party survival, you have a direct skill to make survival itself easier for the tank. You should still use it in bosses as well, especially higher end content, but ranged DPS have one of the best utilities for dungeon runs with this one skill. Even if you're not arranged, you can be hugely useful an asset to the group. A party includes tanks, healers, and you as a DPS. The tank is not the leader of a group, but in a physical sense, they are. The group should follow the tank, not run ahead without them. Everyone else should instead just follow the heels of the tank, like a little lost puppy. There's a lot of reasons for this, most if not all resulting from my personal mantra, all jobs are melee. Let's take it one step at a time. Let's start with the melee role itself to illustrate this. Melee jobs, obviously, need to be in melee range to hit enemies. If you aren't following the tank as close as you can, you're not going to be able to fight enemies until you catch up. There's no reason not to be following them this close. Mid-run, you'll naturally dodge any AoEs that enemies stop to cast. Once the tank stops pulling enemies, you can probably position yourself behind the enemies or to the side for some AoE spam. The less you follow the tank, the less fighting you can physically do, and can also be applied to bosses. Now let's move on to the ranged DPS. Why wouldn't you stay in melee range as a ranged? You have tons of mobility. You can get in and out of range as needed in boss fights. And... Your AoE is melee. All three ranged DPS don't have ranged AoE. Well, you do, some of your OGCDs are ranged, but your main AoE, your GCD, Spreadshot, Quick Knock, and all of the Dancer ones, they're melee based. Literally a melee job in anything more than two enemies. Hell, even two is enough in some cases. And Dancer's Dances? even in single target boss fights, is still a melee skill. But that's just within your role. You're not the only player there. You have allies, and a bunch of your skills don't have infinite range. If you're trying to use those defensive skills I mentioned to buff the party before the boss's raid-wide damage, you might miss some players if you're standing far away. Or, be missed when your allies use abilities. Heals don't have infinite range. Tanks have abilities that affect the team that don't have infinite range. And DPS abilities that buff allies don't have infinite range. Dragoons especially learn to hate every ranged or mage player who stands far away. It's not just healers who hate you, but your own role. Dragon Sight has a pitiful range of only 12 yams, and when it first released, only 6 yams. Most abilities with an area of effect are larger than that, but still limited. You need to be closer. Do it if only for your healers. Heal AoEs are limited in range, but can be very powerful. You can move in so easily whenever you want to, and there's these things healers have that are, you know, bubbles? It doesn't help when you're standing right next to it. It's literally always ranged players. Every single time. A bard, a machinist, whatever. But usually bards. It's 90% of the time it's bards. There will be a healer bubble on the ground. Instead of standing inside the bubble, they stand next to it. Personally, I often use these bubbles as the only heal I will need for raid-wide damage. The only one that will fully heal everyone up. And then if you end up dead because you didn't stand in the bubble, it ends up being your own fault. I tried healing you. You purposefully stood outside of it. And then even you magic DPS don't have an excuse. Except for maybe Black Mage. Red Mage is literally part melee. You use your sword as a sword. It's magically enhanced, but a sword. Summoner is often argued to be more mobile than Red Mage, 
And this isn't even talking about Endwalker Summoner, which is more barred than Black Mage in terms of cast times. The only one of you that really has any excuse is Black Mage. Long cast times, the least mobile, but you still have a lot of abilities that make you more mobile. You should be the first to get into position for a boss, which should be slightly into the room at least. You can walk a few steps into a boss room without aggroing the boss. You don't need to hug the edge of the arena. Then, once your opener is over, you can move even more in as needed. And then there's trash mobs. Acting like a melee while the tank is pulling is even more key for a mage. Spells have a limited range, and you need to stop moving to cast usually. If you know when the tank is going to stop pulling, or be forced to stop pulling, you know where and when you can stop moving. The sooner you are able to stop moving, the sooner you can DPS. And if you're a mile behind the tank, well, you can't do that. You're too far away. Maybe the problem you have is the tank sprinting away. You just can't keep up with that speed, sad face. Stop. Just use sprint yourself. Anytime the tank uses sprint, you use sprint. The tank is being smart to use sprint to pull. It effectively acts as a defensive cooldown in a way. They're going to take less damage from sprinting. If the tank stops to let everyone catch up, and you still fall behind after initially catching up, well, you can only blame yourself at that point. They gave you a chance to catch up and stay at their heels. This all also completely ignores mechanics in fights. Stack markers, a melee player isn't going to leave the boss to run to the edge of the arena 20 yoms away. The tank is even further away. The healer might also be far away. As a result, you're actually the only one super far away. Then there's also cone abilities from bosses. Cones get bigger the further away you are, which means things are harder to dodge. The summoner in this clip gets it over and over and over by the same attack, because the boss is hitting in a large expanding cone behind it. If they stayed close instead, they would dodge the attack no problem. Spreads aren't an excuse either. If everyone gets an AoE on them and you need to spread out, you can usually still fit around the boss. There's only four of you in a dungeon. You can fit one to the north, south, east, and west of the boss. And this is one of the most common things Savage Raiding ends up having you do with eight people. Spreading out around the boss, but you're all still in melee range, roughly. Often these spreads are paired with stack mechanics, where everyone has to run in after the spread. You can't be far away or you miss the stack, or the heals needed to survive. You don't need to be eating the boss's leg, you don't need to even be actually in melee range. You can be a little bit back still, but you should still be close enough for the many reasons listed. Now, running along with the tank isn't a zero-sum game. You just follow until they stop. No, you could throw out some attacks while running, especially as a ranged DPS. All three you can build resources while running along. Put dots on enemies, getting battery and heat, or building feathers. Melee can also be attempting to build resources, or putting up buffs. Disembowel and Eyes, Junpu and Shifu, etc. Point is you don't just have to follow like a drone. But there is still things you need to watch out for. Namely, Enmity. This is, once again, mostly a ranged issue. When running alongside enemies as a melee, you often can only barely manage to put your buffs up. The game freaks out when trying to hit enemies while on the move. Meanwhile, ranged DPS can stand a bit further away from enemies while running, meaning they never run into this problem. But even melee can end up stealing aggro if they do things right. Or wrong, depending on the scenario. But no matter who steals aggro or when, it's your job to fix it. Not the tanks. If they're mid-run and you steal aggro, 
it's up to you to run to the tank. They should not have to stop to pick it back up. They will pick up the enemy off of you when they're done pulling, but not mid-run. Wasting time trying to target the specific enemy you stole using a ranged attack or provoke, it's just that, a waste. Instead, they should be able to just keep spamming their own AoE attacks for damage and aggro generation. The moment you run up to the tank with the enemy in tow, they'll get hit by one of the tank's AoEs and immediately run over to the tank, instead of staying on you. Most of you DPS are melee based anyway, and Black Mage probably isn't going to be stealing aggro mid-run unless they're trying to spam Scathe. So there's no reason not to give the tank the enemy manually. Granted, this also assumes the tank knows what they are doing, but hey, that's like the goal here to know what you're doing. While positionals are a melee only thing, I want to re-emphasize positioning around a boss. Everyone can fit in a loose spread around the boss and react to mechanics as needed. Non-melee should be near, but don't need to be in melee melee range. All well and good, but let me also say to never, ever go in front of the boss, unless you absolutely know what you're doing. Bosses tend to have cleaves. These are attacks that hit in an AoE in front of them. They can be normal casted attacks, or just auto attacks that constantly cleave. Because of this, Standing in front of a boss is just a bad, bad place to be, unless you know it's safe. A good tank will likely not attempt to reposition the boss around you, because that could put everyone else in danger. Of course, if the tank is just randomly spinning the boss, not much you can do there besides keep dodging. Just hope a tank spinning the boss has a reason to be spinning the boss. More often the issue when a tank spins the boss is positionals. All the melee have them, and all the melee would very much do well to make sure they get them. They're attacks that give extra damage or bonus resources for hitting an enemy from a specific position. That is to say, the flank, which means the sides, or rear of the enemy, it adds a bit of complexity to melee DPS rotations. You should always make an attempt to hit your positionals, but you shouldn't make it everything. If you're going to die for your positional, you're really overestimating their power. A dead DPS does zero damage, like I said. A positional is only ever worth at most 90 potency, I believe. Staying alive is a lot more useful than that. You should also not delay your GCD to get a positional. If your attack is ready to be used, hit the button even if you are out of position. You will lose more damage delaying the attack than not getting the positional always be casting, is rearing its ugly head here. Look at that, it just got a positional off on you. But just because you should prioritize living and always attacking, doesn't mean there's no reason not to hit the positional. You have plenty of time between attacks to move into position. Because you should be both in the rear and the flank at the same time. This sounds impossible, but it really isn't in practice. Here's a striking dummy with the sides of the enemy marked with red sections. The front and rear are blank. Notice the specific placement of the red lines. They're directly even with the targeting circle. The open spot in the back of the enemy is the entire rear. You do not need to be centered. I repeat, do not be centered. There is no need. On very small enemies, the rare times you have small bosses, you may want to center anyway. But large enemies, you can just stick to the line that separates rear and sides. Instead of these wide movements from 0 degrees to 90 degrees around a boss, sit at the 45 degree angle and just take two steps to the left and right. Start at 45, one step to the right, you're at the rear positional. Take two steps to the left, you're now at a flank positional. Two steps to the right, back to the rear. It's not this super extremely tight positioning you need to stay in. The entire angle counts. 
and on the biggest bosses, this matters a lot. You physically can't run from the exact rear of the boss to the exact flank within the 2.5 second cooldown, assuming you're playing Dragoon, while the other melee have even less time to adjust. You may even have off-global cooldowns to do while moving, which makes it even harder to make it in time. Abuse the wide angle shown by the target circle. But of course, there's sometimes you can't get your positionals at all. This is where True North comes in. Just pop True North before your positionals come up, and no matter what you do, you will get the positional bonuses. It's really that simple. Just be sure you genuinely can't get the positionals. Mechanics are happening, or the tank refuses to just stop spinning the boss for no reason. Your True North usage is very limited, but still plenty of room for leeway to use it as needed. It takes some of the highs and fighting to really stretch how far True North can go. And then there's content that removes positionals from the equation entirely. They usually bring in new mechanics that need to be managed instead. Eureka and Bogia are much larger scale content and have extra actions tied to them. Deep Dungeons have the randomization factor, traps, and much more, and may not even have a tank to keep enemies centered for you. There's more to manage in these pieces of content, or have reasons to let melees have no issues. These types of enemies are often called omnidirectional. Any enemy or boss that lacks the front-facing arrow and the rear open delineations are front, rear, and sides around the entire enemy. No matter where you hit it, you will get your positional. Even some bosses in normal content are omnidirectional. This is usually due to them being huge bosses that sit outside the arena. If you tried to get to the rear, you'd be 20 moms off the arena's edge. But yeah, both positioning and positionals are extremely important. Stay behind the boss, loosely grouped together. Melees move back and forth as needed. Oh, and a tip for when there's two of you melee players? One of you take the left side, the other takes the right side. You wouldn't believe how many times I see melees all trying to share one spot in the boss when bosses have two flanks. Ranged and mage limit breaks are better than melee limit breaks, because AoE is better when used in AoE situations than a single target attack in a single target situation. O okay, okay, I'll say more on it, but I mean... Genuinely, that's all you need to say on the matter for most limit breaking. Even in many trial and raid scenarios, you can use ranged and mage limit breaks to better effect than melee limit break. But I'll get back to that situation in a moment. Let's start with the dungeons. The big reason why people need to shut up when they say to let the melee use the limit break. In dungeons, tanks will be pulling many enemies at once. Let's just say it takes three enemies for a ranged limit break one to be better than a melee limit break one. Let's just say it's three, like most AoE attacks. Actual power levels don't matter. The tank pulled six enemies, or nine, or even a full 12 enemies that you could hit with limit break, versus one enemy you can hit with melee limit break. And yet, for some weird reason, there are people out there who will get angry if the ranged or mage rightfully use the limit break instead of melee. Now, if the mage is using limit break on a boss, one single target, sure, that's kind of a waste. You would probably even do more damage without the limit break as a mage. There are situations where even melee limit break one is too weak to beat normal attacking. Burst phases, for example. But if the mage is using limit break on 10 enemies at once, who are you to complain? The biggest problem with melee limit break is that a lot of people are also afraid of quote unquote wasting it. If they use the limit break and everyone dies, you don't get it back. But wipes aren't as common as wins in most cases I have seen. Remember, we're talking dungeons at the moment. Four players, relatively easier content. This fear causes them to hold on to limit break and only use it when the boss will die anyway. 
On final bosses, the context is different. If DPS is low and a boss lives for a while, you may end up gaining Limit Break 2. Limit Break 2 is much stronger and very much worth aiming for even if you aren't afraid of wasting it quote unquote. However, the stronger your group is, the less Limit Break you will generate on the average. Which means your average group probably won't see Limit Break 2 in most dungeons. Meaning any and all attempts to save Limit Break to get that Limit Break 2, melee Limit Break 2, would still be weaker than Mage Limit Break 1 on 10 enemies. That's the real waste here. There are even a good number of Trials and Rage where Mage and Range Limit Break is the better option. A5S, Chair Extreme, it gets used in Leviathan, many more too. Trials and Raids have ad phases and such, it's not just all relegated to melee, just usually it's relegated to melee. But even then, it's not a melee's ability to use most of the time. This is because of how most players handle Trials and Raids, especially newer ones people aren't experienced with. Limit Break belongs to the healers. Trials and Raids unlock Limit Break 3, which is the ultimate Limit Break and is insanely powerful. For healers, it's a full party raise and full heal. This is basically one of the only emergency buttons healers truly have. When you get Limit Break 3 as a melee, you just don't use it until the boss is nearly dead. Now almost depends on the fight. In some fights, a boss will have only one very scary mechanic, and if everyone is alive after that scary mechanic, you just Limit Break and go on your day. Others, usually the final fights of a raid tier, they're very scary through the whole fight and you won't even think about using Limit Break 3 until the last 10% of the boss. No matter what, dungeon, trial, raid, etc, don't use it as a finisher to look cool. That is essentially just as wasteful as not using it at all. Often even more wasteful because if the boss would have died sooner without the Limit Break, it's a balancing act all around, but it's pretty easy to balance. Let the ranged and mages spam it for AoE usage. Use melee limit break 3 only when safe, but don't just ignore it either. I wanted to quickly re-emphasize the idea of how your actions affect the other roles and how they play, and vice versa. The quickest way to understand it all is to just play the other roles. Besides the idea of broadening your horizons, it really will make you a better DPS, no matter which sub role you belong to. Tanks live to position bosses for their melee pals, and you'll better understand why you should be following and sprinting with your tank, and why they do it at all, as I mentioned. And ranged in mages playing healers, you'll learn to hate every black mage forever and every ranged player ever because they don't sit in the healing bubble they are standing right next to. Plus, the other roles are easier than being a DPS on the average, at least I would say. There's less to worry about, and some concepts transfer over. And ultimately, it's easier to see how your actions affect the other roles as the other roles. I've tried to explain these concepts to people in dungeons and they just don't get it. So at points where it seems like I'm over-explaining, it's due to experience telling me that the over-explanation is how much you need to explain them at minimum. It's always going to be people who make mistakes or play incorrectly by accident or even on purpose. People who make your life harder by accident. But a lot of the reasons a lot of people have complained about over the years that I have seen, some of them are due to good play instead. Be sure to communicate whenever you have a problem though too like the tank not giving you positionals as a melee. A lot of tanks just don't understand the importance of positionals, and that importance is why some tanks might do specific movements. Really though, just simply play the other roles. You'll understand a lot more. Let's talk about a bunch of random things quickly. Some of the previous topics were short, but needed their own topics for their importance. All of this is still important, but too short for a dedicated topic, or just under the importance for me to make it a full topic. 
commenters really wanted me to make sure to emphasize the useful of dots or damages over time. If you have dots on your job, mostly barred now, make sure you are using them. Dots are calculated as such. Timer divided by 3, then multiplied by the potency of the dot. These are way stronger than your other skills when you add the damage all up. Speaking of tools though, make use of your roll actions besides the healing and defensive ones. Stuns are useful at points, and more importantly is the ranged roll action that allows you to interrupt the enemy, head graze. Whenever you see an enemy with this flashing cast bar, you are seeing an attack that can be interrupted. Every single attack with this pulsing bar can be interrupted. Later on, it becomes extremely important to do this. Your tanks will have the ability to stop these too, but you can too, and you really should. To help you facilitate this, you may want to buck up your UI. A good, comfortable UI layout is way more useful than you might expect even as a DPS. Being able to see your buffs, a good spot for your job gauge to keep an eye on resources and timers, being able to see enemy cast bars, maybe see party buffs on the party list being a bit bigger. You have a lot of options to mess with. Find a layout that works for you. Speaking of layouts though, your hotbar and crossbar layouts is its own issue. Jobs have a lot of buttons as I said, and almost every button is useful. Very few are not useful, and throwing them around the hotbars randomly is not going to be comfortable. You need to try out different layouts for your skills. Mess with your keybinds as much as you need to. Just make sure your hands are comfortable when doing rotations. There are high skill players on every control scheme. You just need to find the layout that best fits you. And you can only find it with a bit of experimenting. On a similar note to control scheme is legacy versus standard. The easiest way to tell the difference is to hold down the S key and swap back and forth. Personally, legacy and replacing turn left and right with strafe left and right is the ideal way to play a melee job, but others do not use that setup. Figure what works for you, perhaps do some experimenting with this. And of course, controller legacy versus standard has its own set of differences unique to that control scheme. Switching gears, let's talk about those gears. Equipment gear. You might be just a DPS, and skill trumps all gearing you could do, but gear is still important. Potentially the least important for DPS next to the other two roles, but that does not mean it's unimportant for you. Least is doing a lot of legwork here. The game gives you plenty of gear. Make sure you're using it and make sure it's gear for your role. In A Realm Reborn, this gear that you could be wearing that isn't good for you. Looking at you, recommended gear button. Stop it. Let's also talk about a couple of healer and healing based topics. If a healer doesn't heal you completely to max HP instantly, this is fine. Stop yelling at your healer if you're not max HP constantly. You don't need to be at max HP. And if you never died, they did their job. If they do let you die, don't use it as an excuse to yell at them either. Communicate instead, especially when often it was your fault you died as re-established, because you refused to stand in the healer bubble or you stood really far away. It's not always their fault. Each of the healers has some form of bubble that heals, at least in Shadowbringers. Asylum, Earthly Star, Sacred Soil, all these are useful skills. All of them. They make you live longer. All of these. Look, I talked about this already, but this really is something that happens way too often, whether I'm the one healing or not. Stand. In. The damn. Healer. Bubble. Maybe you have player effects turned off? Well, you shouldn't. You can turn off effects for non-party members, but if you're never seeing healer bubbles, maybe you should turn back on your healer effects. God damn it, bards! As for you mages, this is a special message to you. Black mages, move closer. You're otherwise alright. Use mana ward and you're even better. Summoners, stop. 
using physic. Low level, I understand why you thought it was a good idea, but you have a healer in group content. That's not you. And when you hit level 50, stop using it altogether. A 200 HP heal when you have thousands of HP is not useful. There's a non-zero number of you who do not get this. As for you ver red ver mages, ver stop ver curing ver please. Ver trust ye healer to heal ye group. If they are struggling and show it, sure, go ahead and ver help. But if nobody is ver dying, you have no reason to use ver cure in party content. Further, you're just as ver bad as bards. You are a very mobile ver mage. You have a melee attack, and yet you all seem to verstand right outside of healing bubbles. If you are so ver worried about the group's HP, maybe care enough to verstand in the bubble that the healer put down specifically to heal you. It'll do more than your Vakir ever ver will. Nope, there is actually a good use for Vakir to prepare a dual cast. But you're not using it for the heal at that point. There's a difference. Conversely, Resurrection and Varese are good skills to be using. A death is a lot more immediate a concern next to a little bit of missing HP. And depending on the context of the death, the healer might be a bit busy trying to keep everyone else alive before worrying about raising a dead party member. There's tons of ways for people to die without it being the healer's fault while still being a situation that requires healer attention. Your mana is also likely maxed out at all times, since DPS mana management is basically non-existent. Even if you ignore lucid dreaming, your mana will be pretty good most of the time, but with lucid dreaming, you have tons of extra mana. The healer might be spending all of it to save the group after some kind of big mistake. That might not have even been their fault, as I said. Plus, the raise in a dual cast is instant. Endwalker Summoner has swift cast still, but we may end up seeing swift cast used as a DPS skill more than ever. They also considered removing resurrection from Summoner, so it may one day vanish entirely. Either way, just make sure the healer hasn't already raised when you go to do it yourself. Let me remind you all again, please use communication. Your chat box isn't just for show, it has a use. Some people might be giving you advice, like kill the ads, which also by the way, ads, additional enemies in boss fights, kill them. I've seen many a wipe in trials and raids where everyone just ignores the extra enemies. That covers all the miscellaneous tips I wanted to cover, so let's get into the main meat of the video. That is of course, a, B, C. Always be casting. You may have come into this guide not understanding what ABC actually means. Always be casting. The explanation for ABC is ABC. That really is all there is to it. What it says is exactly what it means. Always be casting. This is the most important tip that will take the most practice to get right. Anytime you could be attacking, you should be attacking. You should be looking to always have the opportunity to be attacking, no matter what situation you're put into. A major part of this can be learning where to position yourself for specific boss fights. That's not something just mages need to do, even if a true master of black mage must tone their positioning to pixel perfection. Everyone should be conscious of their positioning. And I don't just mean with staying close to the rest of the party. Bosses can have attacks with no AoE markers that only hit specific areas around them. They may do cleaves in the directions of random party members. They could be doing a complex pattern of AoEs that has a safe spot you can be in prematurely. There's a lot of potential situations you can be in. I also previously mentioned melee players spreading around a boss. One melee on the left, one melee on the right. This lets everyone keep their rotation going. Everyone has their space while still all being close together. And importantly, everyone has an escape route. This is a thing people tend not to think of or even mention with avoiding enemy attacks. 
if your escape route has another player in the path, your escape route may end up having an AoE on it and be unsafe. But also remember, you want to keep movement to a minimum and distance to an absolute minimum, especially as a melee. Mobility and distance are tools to be used, not abused. I've harped on this so much, but being far away is not a good thing. Sure, you leave room for everyone else close to the boss, but you could be nearby and still do that. Range DPS can do this extremely easily as well. Move away when needed and move back in once it's safe. Even then though, you don't go out too far. Melee DPS are especially the ones who need to just stop using range at all. As we established, stay in melee range. Let the ranged and mages do the distant stuff. Running super far away from the boss, you're losing damage and making things more dangerous, not less. Spread out around the boss and keep attacking it. If you move far away enough that you can't keep doing your rotation, you probably went too far. Strafing is one of the best ways to achieve this. Strafe around the boss while dodging and you'll lose no damage while still avoiding an attack. This will dodge almost all AoEs that target the player with markers on the ground. Just pivot around the boss and stop at the edge of the AoE marker. You don't need to be several miles away, just a little bit out, and only the center pixel of your hitbox matters. This especially applies to when enemies have AoEs around them. Okay, sure, some bosses have huge AoE markers that make you run far away. But there's also a lot of bosses that have AoE markers that aren't huge massive things you should run away from like a scaredy baby being told to put that cookie down now. Go to any random striking dummy as a melee or tank. Get close, but not too close. Watch for the exact moment the skills on your hotbars lose the red X icon and start letting you use them. This is max melee range. Internalize this distance as best you can. You can't always sit at it at all times because auto attacks have a shorter range, but when a boss has an AoE around them, or gives everyone AoEs on the players to spread out, check max melee range first. This is the ultimate answer to needing distance as a melee to dodge, without losing your ability to ABC. Not your ranged attacks. Your ranged attacks don't break combos as a Vendwalker, but that doesn't make them any better for your average play. There usually isn't enough time to use a ranged attack, even when dodging some of the larger AoEs. If you did have time, you probably left too early. Even when you need to step out, you don't need to step out for long. The game works on a three-fourths rule, essentially. Only the last fourth of a cast bar matters. Dodge out of the AoE right before the moment the cast bar is going to hit 75% completion, and then move back in the moment the cast bar finishes and the orange circle vanishes. You do not need to wait for the animation. Just walk back in once the indicators are gone. Attacks where the animation is what matters is almost exclusively when there's no ground indicator. The only indicator otherwise is the cast bar, and those can lead to cast only or animation only. So your time spent away from the enemy is very little in every situation. And even in the cases where you have to go far and there is theoretically time to use the ranged attack, gap closers, Every melee has them. Ninja has the hardest one to use, I'd say, but you all have gap closers. The moment the orange marker disappears, hit the button. You are now in range of the boss and able to use a good attack instead. It could take practice to use some of the gap closers, Shikuchi especially, like I said, but they're worth spending time learning how to use. And then there's also attacks that act as gap closers, like Dragoon's everything. Spine Shatter, Dragonfire Dive, or even Star Diver. You can learn where to delay one of these by a few seconds just to use the gap closing effects, but you also have to learn where not to hold them for too long. It's a balancing act, but one that once you've learned can make you way more mobile than you already were. I'm gonna say it one last time. 
don't run away every single time even the tiniest market or mechanic happens. It's probably the biggest mistake I see most melee players make. Keep your uptime on the boss. You have a lot more available than you think. And if you're still having trouble, still use sprint. It's not just a skill for moving outside of combat. You can use it in combat and you can use it to dodge better. And you should. Dangerous last second dodges aren't last second if you're moving faster. This is especially good for those large AoEs you are so afraid of. You move out and back in at a much more blazing pace. Sprint is a utility to be used, not ignored like most people seem to. Let's take a moment to talk about something mostly unique to mages, but some other jobs do have cast of skills. That is to say, let's talk about slide casting. Slide casting is abusing the fact that this is an MMO. Due to latency, there is a delay between when the game sees you moving locally and the server's understanding that you are moving. If you have 200 ping, that's 0.2 seconds of latency. So if you try to move when there's less than 0.2 seconds left in a cast, the cast will still complete. This is what slide casting is. The numbers aren't what is important. You can't check your ping in game anyway. But the point is, the higher your ping, the more you can slide cast. But even if you have little to no ping, you can still slide cast. There's some built-in tolerance, even if only a little bit of it. And the more you slide cast, the more you can move and cast, which means more casts in general, and more casts means higher DPS. Now, this is something you guys taught me. There's a trick to learning how to slide cast. Take an emote, any emote, and put it on your hotbar somewhere. Maybe one of your extra bars so you don't hit it by accident. While casting, it will darken and not be usable. But the moment the emote lights up, you can start slide casting. This should make your slide cast learning a lot smoother until you've internalized the timing. The harder the fight, the more casting you will gain compared to easier fights. The more movement required, the more movement will punish you. Utilities for movement are limited, even for Red Mage and Summoner. But if you can apply slide casting, you'll potentially be able to spread out those utilities more, or use them for purely more DPS. You may have also noticed in watching other people play, they do something like I do. With all this key mashing. This isn't for fun. Well, not entirely. It's not for being fancy either. It's to do ABC better. I'd recommend saving yourself the pain and not actually mashing this much. Just learn why we are mashing this much. This is ability queuing. Much like slide casting lets you finish a spell, ability queuing lets you cast sooner. And this is something all the rules makes use of, not just those with lengthy cast timers. For say, half a second before your GCD finishes spinning, the window for queuing opens. So if you hit a button before you can actually use the skill, the game will recognize you hit the button still and activate the skill the moment the GCD finishes. So while you don't need to mash the keys, you should learn to press the buttons earlier than you might think you need to. If you wait until only after the buttons light back up, you're losing a lot of time and a lot of damage. There's also the idea of weaving. Global cooldowns all share a 2.5 second cooldown. Cooldown abilities, offensive or defensive, are off global cooldowns. They do not cycle when using a GCD. So if you use an OGCD between GCDs, this is called weaving, and you can weave up to two times between global cooldowns. Consider there to be two weaving windows between every global. Each window can contain one skill. However, consider that the win of the button press matters a lot for weaving due to animations. So let's do a mini exercise. Take your global cooldown's recast timer. The base cooldown is 2.5 seconds. Cut this in half and we get two weaving windows of 1.25 seconds. However, let's split it in half again so we have four pieces. Each one is 0.62 seconds 
and ignore the extra millisecond that's gone missing. Now, consider every weave to take up one and a half windows. If you queue your skills up as soon as you can, hitting the keys the moment your GCD goes off, your two weaves will line up, say, like this. You still have that half a second of leeway at the end, but if you say, wait a window and then some before you use an ability, but still weave two skills back to back, the weaves extend beyond the window and clip into your global cooldown. This is why ability queuing and properly weaving is so important, despite seeming like some super advanced topic. The earlier you get practice on pressing buttons sooner than later, the better your rotations will come out. It adds up very quickly to making you perform better. Also keep in mind, some abilities take up more weaving time. For example, all of Dragoon's jumps. They all take up at least three windows, so you will always lose time if you try to use two weaves when one of them is a jump. And then there's Star Diver, which which is, uh, um, uh, yeah. The issue extends further for you casting players, mostly Black Mage, because you have little to no instant cast abilities. Your weaving windows are limited. Swift cast and triple cast in themselves need to be weaved, and most of your skills have cast times. You need to abuse procs and all of your instant cast skills, otherwise, Half of your weaving window, at least, will be taken up by your cast times. So while you need to weave a lot less on average, you need to focus a lot more on when you weave. It comes with the territory, and if only makes ability queuing all the more important, since you have less space time for the skills to fit in. Jobs with shorter GCDs than 2.5 also have less time for weaving. If your global cooldown is two seconds? Well, you better have perfect weaving down. And stuff like Machinist's 1.5 second hypercharge GCD for Heat Blast? You can only single weave. Again, you don't need to be mashing like I tend to do, but do try and learn from my footage. It isn't just to be fancy or such, it's to make my damage come out stronger than ever. And the comfier you are with keeping your rotation going, the better a DPS you will become. This is something you'll be slowly learning over your entire time as a DPS, so don't rush it. But do make time to learn it all. Every little bit of damage you gain from the little things adds up to be a whole hell of a lot of damage when added together. Thank you for watching ABC, A Beginner's Guide to DPS. We went over many, many, many topics that will be implemented as you progress. But the more you implement, the more you improve. Take it a step at a time and follow the evolution of topics I attempted to lay out for you. The more you play, the more you learn, and the more you see how something can be used. Feel free to leave feedback or further advice for newbie DPS to know as they train themselves, or even ask questions on something you didn't understand within the video. This is here to help after all, but be sure to check the description for any added information as well. Maybe Endwalker changes more than we expect or such. Perhaps at one point I will also create a video on intermediate level DPSing. And yes, for as deep as that all seem to go, there's way more that can be talked about. Keep an eye out for that. But the future holds many possibilities. But otherwise, take care and may the power of an added hogs lay waste to your enemies. And an extra special thanks to all my patrons over on Patreon. And an extra, extra special thanks to Amen Al Khatib, Bennett Begurn, Benjamin Hahn, Crikey, mate, Ethan, Ethan Olson, James, Jericho, Kevin Lowe, Kyle Steinhauser, Mizella, Scott Stanley, T Rogue, Ticklefinger, and Valor LLC. Links down below, all that good stuff. Thank you for watching and have a good day.